790-0251, there is a line available there. One, effectively, this is a toss-up. It's going to go right down to the wire. Hopefully, there was going to be a playoff. I personally think there will be and won't be a strike. i got to let you fly. I'm going to a great trade. Duff, i got to go. The lines are full. All right, we'll go up here. Go ahead. You're on Sunday Sports Talk. Hey, Mitch. Great seeing you again. Yeah. Hey, what's up? What's up? So, um, you know, I, I saw a lot of these uh, podcast interviews that you've been doing over the last uh, year and a half or so, and there was a couple of them that I, I took note of. The, the first one was Serge Beauchemin. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a re- of mine. really cool one. You know, I learned the pizza delivery story from that podcast. I hadn't I hadn't known about that one. Uh, and then you had Mike Cohen, which I, I, I've known for about 15 years. Uh, a couple of nice ones, too, with the with the boys, the interview dudes. That was yeah. good in Ottawa and Xander as well. Yeah, Xander's great. You know, I just um, I think that part of uh, this whole COVID you know, COVID, I would say, you know, lifestyle, not much of a lifestyle, but part of the COVID life is um, that I really enjoy doing these podcasts because I'm, you know, I'm home or I'm, you know, I'm in Seattle and I have a chance to, you know, interact with people. Uh, I haven't been, you know, socializing very much, haven't been traveling all that much. Um, so yeah, you know, decent people ask me to do a podcast. It's fun. I did Pompiano on cryptocurrency and a few others. So, fun. so I always thought like, um, you know, we've known each other for over a three decade period. We've, you know, we've crossed paths with each other. Uh, it all started with your radio show. And I said to myself, hey, in all of those podcasts, no one ever talks about the fact that you did radio, sports radio. Sure. Uh, the fact that I've become a public address announcer uh, today, uh, the path that led me to to this today, you know, there, there were some influences, some were indirect influences, some were direct influences. You know, I've always, you know, in the eighties, when, uh, as a kid growing up, I've, I've always idolized, uh, people like Dick Irvin, Bob Cole, uh, uh, Dan Kelly, uh, from CTV, Vin Scully from the Dodgers and NBC. I know yours was Howard Cosell. Is that yeah, also, also Danny Gallivan? Um, I don't know if you're too young for that, but Danny Galvin was really. really well, I was too young, but I've I've heard the broadcast, the 1979 game, for instance, yeah. that, that that famous game, Game Seven against the Bruins, uh, and of course there's Claude Mouton, Michel Lacroix. So if I were to build a lineup, you know, a, a starting lineup, a, a, a baseball starting lineup, I would place you as the leadoff man, because uh, you g- always get things going. You've always been a good influence. I mean, I've listened to, I've always enjoyed, you know, listening to the broadcasts, to, to the games, everything revolving around the production of a game and being involved in sports. And that's something I've, I've always wanted to be a part of, but I was just very, very shy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, as a kid growing up, uh, extremely shy, a bit of a loner, uh, uh, very quiet, but I did love recording myself, imitating those announcers, pretending to be those announcers, pretending to be a part of the game. But it was just like a dream. Like you never think you'd, you'd be able to, to, to reach high levels uh, in, in that field. It's interesting you say that because, um, you know, Howard Stern talks about himself as a young teenager the same way. Um, I didn't know Mitch Melnick when he was a teenager, but I've known him for just a little more than 30 years right now. And he's an introvert, you know, Mitch on the radio is not at all the same as Mitch uh, off the radio. So I think there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot of people that were not necessarily extroverts outside of the radio. And and when you hear them on the radio, you you would be led to, to believe differently. Um, You know, I appreciate you saying that. I think when, you know, one of the things I'm kind of most um, proud or nostalgic about maybe both is that, Um, a, I got to work with Mitch Melnick. Uh, B, I got to bring Ted Tiemann back to Montreal from Windsor. Uh, that was great, great time uh, in my life. Um, had something to do with Tony Marinaro starting in radio, something to do with Pierre Maguire getting on the radio, um, something to do with Paul Grafe being on the radio. There's a number of people that, you know, were in and around me and Mitch um, in the early nineties and, uh, who have 
you know, paved great careers for themselves. And I'm just happy to be a small part of all that. So what was it for you when you started this like gig on the side? Cause you had graduated, you, you became a lawyer. What started uh, the passion for that? Like, where was it heading? Was this just like a sideline thing? Cause how did you balance both? Cause you were doing yeah. those very late in the morning, like very late at night. And well, I was also young. Yeah. So I was able to do that. I mean, um, it was a sideline thing, but what a lot of people don't know is that I did radio McGill when I was at McGill university from 1983 to 1986. So I was on the radio at McGill and I wrote for the McGill tribune. I covered soccer, the men's soccer team. Um, I had written for the Hampstead or the Hampstead journal, uh, for years before that. So I, I was dabbling in sports well before I got on the air uh, at CFMB. And what got me on the air at CFMB was I was uh, I accompanied a guest onto Mitch Melnick's show at CJAD at the time. And I accompanied a guest onto Dino Sisto's show at CFMB. And, you know, I think Dino kind of gave me that opportunity. Um, and, I, and I pursued the opportunity at CFMB and I ended up buying time there. That was the only way to get on the, get on the radio, which I did. And I was happy to have done it, sell sponsorship, which I also did. Um, so, yeah, I had a passion for this long before. I was imitating Howard Cosell as a kid, like you were. Um, maybe you weren't imitating Cosell, but somebody else. And then, you know, I just, I just kept on. When you like something, you, you try to find ways to do it. You know, whether it's just you talking into a microphone in your, in your basement or whether you're, you're finding your way onto the radio, I just got lucky. Um, I was in the right place at the right time. You know, when, you, when we searched for that show, there's no evidence anywhere on the internet that it existed. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to go <laughs> back. You know, I, I listened to Ted Teven, to Melnick, to Dino Sisto on CFMB. So I, I was going back and forth, but it was really your show where I felt comfortable to be able to, to make that first call. And I was dying to get on. I really wanted to express myself. So just a, a quick story in 1991, um, you know, I've always, you know, dreamed of being a player when we were young, you know, to be around professional sports. I was really lucky in that I got a gig as a visitor, uh, the visiting clubhouse bat boy backup. So I did like a half season as a bat boy in the visitors clubhouse in 1991 uh even then like i was really really intimidated back then like to be around uh, around these uh, these pro ball players but um it was like a, a first step like that I, that i really wanted to be involved in some way in professional sports so yes I'm not a player but i got to be a bat boy i got to you know communicate with players and i do have one souvenir i'll just show it to you the first ever game i did was Tommy Green's no hitter against the Expos. Was that the Phillies? Phillies, yeah. yeah. And, and from that game, I have a bat, which is a John Crux bat. Wow. <laughs> from that yeah, game. I'd rather, I'd rather be the bat boy for the visiting team. You know, you get to see uh, at the time, I guess, you know, Bonds, Guerrero, so here's, Garvey, here's what Bobby I, Smith, so many players that you got to meet. Uh, I ran across all those players. The only one that's ever refused an autograph was Barry Bonds. Um, but uh, I never took autographs for myself. I did it for friends and family. Mm -hmm. so they had an item to sign because I felt I was really fortunate to be here. So if I were to get one autograph, let me do it for someone else. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So I felt, but little did I know that it only well, lasted a half a season. Right. Uh, but uh, during that next season, uh, like before the start of the 92 season, uh, that's when I finally, you know, had the courage to, to make a, a phone call. I called your show. Um, I was, I, I was calling for, for uh, trivia questions, but it was a way I got comfortable because I found my niche in, in being able to do trivia questions. So, uh, I wanted to play a clip of, yeah. uh, back in 1992. It was the second call that I've ever made. And, uh, this is how it went. Let's hear it. David now Mayhouse. everyone wants to comment on this. Where am I going, uh, Mr. Meyer? We'll go up here. Go ahead. You're on Sunday Sports Talk. Yeah, I'll answer the uh, trivia question. Then. Yeah, go ahead. Pat LaFontaine, Jimmy Carson, Joe Mullen, and Bob Carpenter. Where's, uh, where's the Golden Brett? 
Is yeah. he American or Canadian? He's, he's, he's a bit of both. He's a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. Pat LaFontaine. Yes. Right. Jimmy Carson. Yes. That's right. Joel Mullen and yes. Bob Carpenter. You That's got right. Them. You got him. And Brett Hulk, we use him or not? I don't think so. Well, why not? Well, he played for the Americans it's in the Canadian, Canadian Cup. He hey, must be he, American. When he scores his 50 goals, does he score him as an American or as a Canadian? Well. You win a t-shirt, all right? right. Actually, no. You know what? We'll send you to champs. You, you deserve to see some sports for free. How okay. you like that? What's your name? Fred. Fred. Flintstone? Nope. <laughs> I think I said that last time. Yeah. My jokes are getting old. Yes, they are, Mitch. All right. I'll find a new one. What else on your mind, Fred? What do you think of uh, a trade with the wall Cal Daniel? Yeah, good trade. Yeah. Been talking about it for the last three weeks, but it's not going to happen, I don't think. Yeah. I'm getting that impression. Although people are saying Cal Daniel's not a first baseman. You're not looking for a first baseman, just a guy who can play first base and hit at the plate. That's good enough. All right. You give me a guy who can hit 280, make a couple of errors at first base, I'll take him. Over a guy who's going to hit 230 and be a solid first baseman defensively speaking. Put you on hold. You got a gift certificate at Champs Bar and Restaurant, 3956 St. Lawrence Boulevard, just south of Duluth, the only place in Montreal. So, yeah, that was obviously name the U.S. born. We're not sure if it was U.S. born or U.S., but on on websites today, they'll include Brett Hall that have scored 50 goals in a season. Uh, I wouldn't I would have forgotten Jimmy Carson today. Like if you ask me the question today, I would never have gotten Jimmy Carson. And since then, there were five other players that that um, managed to get the 50 goal uh, mark. Uh, one of them played for the Habs, but he scored 50 elsewhere. Who's that? He uh, was in a big trade that turned out to be not such a great trade at the time. Crazy. Yeah, my brain's on fog. <laughs> John LeClaire. John, my, you know what? I almost forgot. That's crazy, eh? That John LeClaire scored 50 goals. Scored for the Flyers? For the Flyers. John LeClaire. Um, and then there was Mike Medano. Um, Keith Kachuk, maybe? Yeah, Kachuk got a couple of times. And then during that 92 season in which I called, there were two players that, that got it that year, but they hadn't reached it at that point. Who are they? One's in Pittsburgh. One's in Pittsburgh. Who's the American in Pittsburgh? And the other one? So Kevin Stevens. And Jeremy Roenick. Yeah, Roenick, I know. Kevin Stevens, yeah, that I, that I vaguely remember. Yeah. So uh, you sent me to Champs, but unfortunately, I was, I was a minor. I was like 17. Um, <laughs> uh, so I only got to go to Champs two years later uh, to watch a Braves Expos game in the afternoon. Do you remember that series, the 94 series, where Cliff Floyd hit the home run? Uh, no, sorry, sorry. It was the Braves on the road. We took the first two on the road against the Braves. And then the third one we lost in the afternoon. But we were still in first place back then. And you, and you, and you went to, uh, to Champs. You know, I remember afternoon game. Champs. I mean, for this game, it was probably on regular television. But, you know, at that time, Champs had a satellite dish and no one else had us. There were no residential satellite dishes in that, at that time. Exactly. So I tried to explain to my kids that you had to go to Champs if you wanted to watch it game that wasn't televised a crucial um, yeah exactly i wonder what year champs closed actually and uh, it was a great place we really had a, a lot of good times there so uh one of the things that i was wondering about yourself is that when you were doing that radio show it was pretty pretty late in the, in the evening uh sometimes you'd go on for three hours uh 10 p.m to 1 a.m yeah non-stop um yeah. So did that, do, do we automatically think that, did that make you kind of like a night owl at that point? Or, I mean, you worked a lot. You, you had, I don't think it made me a night owl, but um, unbeknownst to me at the time, it was a really good training for certain things that would happen later in my life. So not the staying up late part, but the, when I started on the radio, there were no calls, right? And then I, I got, you know, somewhat popular and then it was, you know, I, I had, I always had a full bank of calls, but at the beginning, I didn't have any. So if you can imagine talking for three hours without anyone to talk to without, and you know, just reading sports news off the ticker, referring to articles in sports illustrated, having about five newspapers in front of you looking for interesting stuff to comment on and talk about and not having anyone to talk to. Um, then I had Mike DeCastris to talk to. So that was much easier, you know, having someone to co-host the show with me. So, but 
there so were times when I had no one to talk to. So what happened to Mike? I, I can't see anything online about. Um, no, we, we, we connected not too many years ago. Yeah, I can find him. I can find him somewhere. <laughs> so no, uh, he didn't pursue any. No, I don't think so. Um, no, any, any radio career you mean afterwards? Yeah. I think he stayed on the radio a bit afterwards, but I don't, I don't know. He didn't pursue anything. Um, yeah, I, I've lost track. I lost track of Dino Sisto as well. Um, I should try to find him. You're just bringing up some names of people that I wouldn't mind trying to reach out to and find, you know, after all these years. Mike DeCastris, the mad dog. Yeah, the mad dog. Good kid. Good kid. He's not a kid, but great guy. <laughs> um, probably haven't seen each other in, you know, 20 something years, maybe. Were you around the same age? Or? Um, he's younger than I am. Yeah, yeah, he's not, okay. yeah, he's not 57. I don't think he is. Okay. okay. I'll try to find him. So, uh, yeah, so... I started staying up late, I guess, till one o'clock in the morning, which was not that great for an 11th grader. Yeah. Uh, but then. But don't, forget, but don't forget that radio, you know, it's part of staying up late, listening to the radio was part of being a young sports fan at the time. Yeah. Ted TV was very popular late at night. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to him late at night. You fell asleep to the radio. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, so today, I don't know if anyone has a radio next to their bed. Yeah. You know, they don't, they use the radio on your phone, I guess. But I don't think anybody, I don't think kids today listen to a baseball game on the radio and fall asleep. So when the Canadians were playing, the Canadians, when the Expos were playing on the West Coast, I'd fall asleep listening to the baseball game. Exactly. Now with Seattle playing in the West Coast, and I'm much older and I have a much harder time staying up. You know, so I'm, and I, I haven't missed a game yet this year. I've watched every single game or been at the game. Um, I've missed a period, but I haven't missed a game. And so these 10, 10, 30 starts are deadly. Absolutely I, I, that's exactly deadly. what I was thinking about because I was thinking, Hey, 1 AM, he's going to come back to that schedule. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. It's, you know, it's not that often. Uh, well, it is that often they're playing, you know, half the games are played in Seattle. That's a 10 o'clock start for the most part. Um, the other night we played in San Jose, 10 30 start that, that extra half hour almost killed me. But um we got lucky in that game because we went 12 minutes without a whistle. It's the second longest, I believe, in history. There was a 14-minute something game way back. And so we had 12 minutes without a whistle in the first period. So it was great. First period ended really quickly, 0-0. Nice. Um, so that was really pretty good. So speaking of 1 a.m., I just wanted to make you hear that third call that I found uh, uh, from the archives that I looked through uh, during the pandemic. And I found this call where I won a trivia question. It, it was, it's really trivial today. Everybody knows the answer to this question. So I'll make you hear it and let okay. you come in. All right, let's play it. By the way, the Expos, Moises Alou, has a father with the team. You know who that is. He also has a cousin on the Montreal Expos. Isn't that a fluke? Tell me who it is. You're going to the fights on Tuesday. No one has even hazarded a guest. Let's take two calls, 30 seconds apiece, and then we'll go to the alternative rock show with Mike Biscott. Go ahead. Okay. No, uh, is it Jerry Manuel? No, it's not Jerry Manuel. Okay, that's all. All right, thank you. Well, the answer is not Jerry Manuel. Although, I, you know what? I think there is some, there might be some relation between, there might be some relation between Moises Alou and Jerry Manuel. I think all those. Uh, it's not who I'm. Th it's not who I'm thinking of, though. I think all those Dominicans are somehow interrelated. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, a racist comment from. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Jeez, you're picking on me tonight. Can I give the answer? No, I don't think you know the answer. All right, go ahead. Give me a shot. Go back to Reyes. No, it's not. Oh, damn. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Mel yeah. Rojas. It is Mel Rojas. Yeah. The last caller at 101. That was my next. Is going wow. to fight. On Tuesday Good evening, job. you'll see Sean O'Sullivan and Alex Hilton. You'll see Otis Grant and Todd Nathan. You'll see Duke Armel, serious two-time world kickboxing champion in his first professional boxing fight at the Montreal Forum. Who am I speaking to? That fight. That's three, three trivia questions in a row that I got. Hey, Fred. <laughs> That's right. Fred, you got to lay off this, Fred. All right, Fred, I'm going to put you on hold. You'll talk to Mike Fiscott. Give him your, na your name, your first and last name, and you will pick up your tickets at the press entrance of the Montreal Forum on Tuesday. Hopefully no one out there knows your name so they can pick up the tickets in your in your spot. <laughs> All right, Fred, hey, Fred, hold on. Hey, this guy's unbelievable. The man's a walking encyclopedia. Fred Flintstone, I call him. <laughs> Excellent call. See how I spit out the answer immediately because I didn't want Mike to get to, to right. get right. You didn't want it to become 105 a.m. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't want anybody uh, him to throw out the answer again. So speaking of Ted Teven, you brought him back. Mm -hmm. All my life, I've listened to his show. I got to make one 
and only one call with him. Let's hear it. And that was in 1995. 790-0600. Let's go back to the telephone lines. You're on the air. Please go ahead. Yeah, how's it going? Ten of my first time part. Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm a dispatcher here on, 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 on the Uni Taxi, and I'm doing a radio show. I've got uh, terrific guests, and i got wonderful callers. Who could ask for anything more? Oh, uh, I could name uh, three other players that were on the diary. All right. I remember Sean Berry hit a home run. Sean Berry is correct. Yeah. Uh, Mike Lansing. Mike Lansing is correct. You got two. And Keep Ron going. Dell. What? Rondell White. Rondell White. Rondell White. What? Rondell White. Rondell White. Rondell White. No. 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 I recall him playing in the game. No. No. Starting lineup. Maybe he came in later. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the starting lineup. The first nine. Okay, well, obviously, that's my seven. Good work. What's your first name? Fred. Fred? Yep. Fred, you sound extremely dynamic to me. I was at the game tonight. You were? <laughs> Fifth game of the season for me. Wow, that's a lot of games, eh? Team looks good. Four and one record for the Parker. How did you like uh, Carlos Perez? Excellent. I think uh, he's got a shot at the Pratt, possibly being the third starter. Well, he's, he's so far so good. So far so good. He went into the... Um... What I like is that he doesn't waste any time. He just uh, goes after the hitting. Yeah. Quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very fast. He pitched five and two-thirds uh, innings. He gave up only four hits. Yeah. Exciting uh, pitch. Yeah, very, very good. He was, uh, he was crowd pleasing. Anyhow, don't go away. You're going to Melnick on the road, and we're busting away from the news. We'll be back in about... So another prize, and one of the intimidating things for calling uh, Ted was you don't want to be machine gunned. So, or you do, or you did, you know, <laughs> some people did. One of my favorite interviews that you did during the pandemic was the one you did with Le Devoir. Le Devoir was about giving, and one of the things I learned is, a, a point that I, I noted down is, donner jusqu'au point où ça fait mal. And, you just, know, av just avant, just avant que ça fait mal, ouais. Just avant que ça fait mal. Um, and w some colleagues of mine at, uh, at work, uh, you know, we're, we're investment advisors and, uh, we were looking for a charity or, or a foundation, uh, to be able to contribute to. And they got together and they gave us a list of four and I said, okay, we picked one and they ended up picking one. I didn't know anything about it. And I was like, okay, I'm on the fence. Cause there's some that I may like, or may not like. And then I heard this clip of you in 1992 saying this. Well, there I want to talk about share the warmth and what an appropriate evening it is to talk about sharing the warmth because it's freezing cold out there and you're sitting at home and listening to us on the radio. Or you're in your car and listening on the car radio, but there are a lot of people that don't have a home or a radio and they're cold this evening. And uh, thank goodness for share the warmth. I'm going to give you the phone number 933-5599. If you're going through your closets and you find some clothing that you no longer need, you no longer wear, and that you can spare, particularly winter coats and sweaters and turtlenecks and pants. And that's the cause. And I discovered it. And when it was, when I heard that, I said, no brainer. I'm going with that one for sure. What year was that? 1992. It was in the very, very first early, early days. And Share the Warmth still exists. It still exists. J'ai appris de cet euh, organisme, Share the Warmth, euh, il y a environ 30 ans, quand un ami avait fait un message. Euh, bien sûr, quand on est jeune, on ne pense pas qu'on peut faire une différence, mais quand je suis allé revérifier, j'ai appris de cette opportunité-là qu'on pouvait s'impliquer avec mes collègues, j'ai revérifié euh, ce message-là. C'était bel et bien la même fondation, Share the Warmth, le même numéro de téléphone, ça n'a pas changé. Alors, quand j'ai appris ça, J'avais vraiment hâte d'en apprendre davantage pour pouvoir faire uh, une différence. Wow. Okay, send me the clip, please. Yes, I'll, I'll send you that clip. So, Mitch, uh, it was amazing catching up with you. Thanks, uh, thanks again. Those those memories were great. They're really, uh, you know, very meaningful to me because it was my beginning. I'm, I'm totally, totally. Oh, first of all, I'm I'm very touched, and yeah. I am honored that you have such a good memory and good memories of me and me yeah. and you, and that it goes back. You know, history is uh, something that I have a lot of respect for, meaning I wasn't a rich guy back then. I was just a guy on the radio, really loving 
what I was doing and just trying to make it. And uh, so I have a great fondness for the old days where it was just really innocent and, and fun and real. And that's why Mitch and I are such good friends. You know, he just, we just see each other like we did 30 years ago doing sports hot seat or whatever. So yeah, um, yeah you know, if I could have, I'm glad to have had any kind of uh, impact that people like you have made my life much more fulfilling. So thanks for always reaching out and let's continue to reach out to each other and, uh, and follow each other. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks Fred, okay, appreciate it.